recording. Go to my PowerPoint. So infrared analyzers. Uh, what have I got here for revision 21? Infrared analyzers, ILM 31041 or 404E. So our learning objective today for the infrared analyzers, describe the difference between dispersive infrared DIR and non-dispersive red, uh, non-dispersive analyzers is NDIR. Um, so dispersive means, you know, when we were talking about having a filament for a light source uh, that, that will give us a UV, ultraviolet spectrum, uh, the, the visible spectrum, that's, that's a dispersed, that whole uh, spectrum is dispersed. But there, we also have non-dispersed analyzers and the reason we do that is because there's certain chemicals and certain um, uh, components, molecules, whatever we're talking about, that we want to analyze and we have to have specific and narrow um, spectrum range. So that's the non-dispersive. It's got to be very, very selective. And we'll be talking about that. Describe the sources, cells, and detectors used by um, non-dispersive analyzers. Describe negative and positive filtering techniques as applied to in an industry and describe process applications for infrared analyzers. Uh, mostly with infrared analyzers, we're measuring for CO, CO2. So describe the difference is our learning objective number one between uh, dispersive infrared and non-dispersive. So again, it's going back to uh, our, our light spectrum. So dispersive analyzers scan the sample with a broad range of IR wavelengths. Um, Non-dispersive measure the intensity of a small wavelength band. So there's our IR region according to our uh, spectrum. So it's, it's 0 0.8 to 1,000 micrometers. That's our range. And when we do this, uh, we're using actually quantitative. So there's, they're talking about a dispersed infrared is going to do qualitative. And then a non-dispersed usually will, will do the uh, quantitative, how much of that. Once we find out what's in it, then we find out how much. And obviously we're using, um, we already know what we're measuring. Like we say, okay, so if we're going to measure, so CO2 or CO, um, we pick the, the analyzer infrared with the proper light spectrum of the IR spectrum. So, and when it shows here, I've got quantitative, how much of it, and notice that is non-dispersed. So if I'm just looking for qualitative what's in it, as far as what's being absorbed, and we're going into this absorption and transmittance again, and this is how these are detected. So I have the IR analyzers, so a dispersive IR analyzers, qualitative analysis, offline laboratory analyzers, non-dispersed IR analysts as quantitative and online process analyzers. So uh, the ones that are in situ and or the ones that have sample systems extractive on, on say a stack. So infrared radiation is electromagnetic radiation, EMR. We talked about the EMR before. And its wavelengths are 0 0.8 to 1,000 micrometers or micrometers. So again, we're on the right-hand side of the uh, visible uh, region. So I have less energy uh, in the IR region. So wavelengths. So wavelengths here get longer. As my wavelengths get longer this way, uh, my energy and frequency decline, my energy and frequency on this side of the spectrum, all the way to UV and uh, the, other, the other end, we have higher energy and higher frequency. Again, 
as I say, in the spectroscopic analyzers, we talked about decreased energy, decreased frequency, increased frequency, increased energy. If IR absorption can only happen if there are two or more covalent bonds, or bonds must be different types of atoms. So if I don't have these two situations, I will not have any absorption of IR infrared radiation. So monatomic molecules do not absorb infrared radiation. This is important to know. So you're looking at this, and this is helium. So IR, IR is not absorbed. And homonuclear uh, uh, diatomic molecules do not absorb infrared radiation either. And that'd be something like nitrogen. So N2. So IR is not absorbed. And again, we're looking at these frequencies here, right? So if these frequencies are similar to the light spectrum frequencies, they will add to it and they will actually, in this case, they don't absorb, but that's what we're talking about. We're talking about um, the cyclic or uh, radiation, and this, this would be vibration. So nitrogen is often recommended to be the zero gas because it will not absorb IR radiation. And nitrogen is easier to get than helium is. So infrared absorption, page four, heterol nuclear molecules absorb IR radiation. So this is what we're looking for. CO2, CO, uh, CO2, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide. These molecules are made up of two different types of atoms. So homonuclear uh, do not absorb IR radiation, as we say. So I've got some of these here. This isn't, a, this isn't really important, uh, but it just gives you an example on page four. So this is IR, uh, IR absorption type molecules. These are all heteronuclear right here. So we got CO, CO2, H2O, uh, methane, CH4, ethane, C2H6, all that kind of stuff. All of these absorb IR radiation. So we could analyze all of these with IR. The ones we can't are these oxygen, nitrogen, uh, chlorine, hydrogen. These do not absorb. So these are these are just examples. Tetranuclear mo mo uh, molecules are polarized. All that means is when their bonds, one, one is slightly negative and one is slightly positive. And their bonds vibrate at specific uh, frequencies. And these bonds will absorb IR with the same frequency. So when I have these, uh, these electrons that are, that are cruising around uh, the nucleus and there's bonds there, uh, those bonds uh, are attached um, by frequencies also. Um, and if those frequencies are the same frequencies uh, as the IR spectrum, uh, IR will be absorbed with them. So here we have uh, CO2, and we have these bonds. See, this is so. This is this is what's holding these bonds together: electromagnetic radiation in waves. And I've got a slightly negative and slightly positive um, elements that are bonding together. So bonds vibrate at IR frequency will be absorbing IR frequencies. So polarized um, oxygen is slightly negative while the carbon is slightly positive. And that's what we call polarized bonds. <clears throat> Again, the IR uh, region is 0.8 to 1,000 micrometers. So an IR, IR absorption spectrum of unknown substances can be matched with a spectrum of known substances for qualitative analysis. Again, we compare um, our spectrums and we compare our absorption rates and transmission uh, transmittance uh, with laboratory known compounds. So in this case here, when I look at this, I have transmittances here. So how much is transmitting and then the wavelength. So I've got CO2 here uh, going through here. It absorbs at approximately four. 
and then it looks over here it's approximately 15 and that's on our peaks now this one absorbs and i'll, I'll explain this later this one absorbs uh, quite a bit and then this one absorbs less but this one uh, causes the ones to bend and this one over here i'll just explain that to you transmittance so at four micrometers the ir radiation causes the covalent bonds of the carbon and the oxygen to stretch so right here at four micrometers we got stretching happening between the covalent bonds and that's the absorption so it absorbs quite a bit on this one over here around 15 the ir radiation causes the covalent bonds between carbon and oxygen to bend these are the these cause them to stretch and these cause them to bend so the different um, wavelengths cause different things but this is all with uh, carbon dioxide so as you're reading through your ilms you'll understand where this absorption rate comes in here and how comes it's it's so high and then absorption right here at 15 and why it's uh it's wider and it doesn't it uh, it doesn't absorb as much as this does at four at four so you could use both of these as an analyzer wavelength to put in so that'd be non-dispersed so analyzers perform qualitative analysis a absorbance and t transmittance here's a formula that you've seen before in the previous ilms So with my A as absorbance, I get absorbance is a log of one over transmittance in your ILMs, and your uh, that is in your formula sheets. This comes up quite a bit because we're talking about transmittance and we're talking about absorbance. So six main components of DIR. Uh, multi-wavelength IR source. So in this case, I've got a, a, some sort of source here that's got multiple wavelengths because it's dispersive. This means dispersive infrared and NDR is non-dispersive. So this is multi-wavelength uh, IR source. You've got a reference cell, which is two. So this is your reference cell. So this reference cell uh, would most likely be just uh, pure air. Sample cell is three, and that's containing an IR absorbing gas. So whatever we're analyzing for it comes through this sample cell. Uh, rotating chopper. We haven't talked about these rotating choppers. Um, and they're very important because it's, it, kind, it kind of prevents drift. So the output here, when, I, when I'm, this is, a, this is the chopper, and it rotates. As it rotates around, the first time, this uh, you've got these uh, concave uh, mirrors, shines on here and goes through. There's a little hole in here, and hits <clears throat> hits a reflective source and off to the um, analyzer. Well, this is part of the analyzer. So monochromator uses a dispersed device. Uh, to separate IR wavelengths if need be, and then the IR detector. So that's after. All of this is after. And we'll be talking about five and six, which is the monochromator and, and the uh, IR detector. So here's where I've, uh, I'm going to show you the, um, the actual chopper. Um, this chopper, because it's rotating, uh, it alternates between the sample cell and the reference cell. So in this case, this is a sample beam going through. And as soon as that turns, you can see this arrow, this thing just spins and spins. And then the, when, it, when it spins the other way, it's got a reference, it's got a mirror here. So the reference beam comes here and goes there. So what I'm getting in my analyzer is uh, alternating reference and, and sample, reference sample, reference sample. And I'll show you that on the next slide. Um, and that prevents drift. When you chop it up, it, it prevents drift. 
So here it is here. So this is from the chopper reference or sample beam. Um, you got your, all your IR wavelengths. It comes here and this, this grading, right, will be turned and it will select which IR wavelength we want which IR wavelength it would be four microns or, or micrometers or 15, depending on what we're looking for. So, but this, this is a turning grading and we don't talk, we don't talk more about this because uh, we already did in spectroscopic analyzers. So in this case here, you get all your wavelengths coming from the, the previous page off to uh, turning grading and to the other. So this is what you're seeing here is your reference right your reference cell and then your sample cell now this is time and this is detector signal in this case there's no absorption in my reference cell and there's absorption here no absorption in my reference cell and absorption here and because we split them up it's almost like a digital signal uh, through that chopper it, it just prevents, uh, it, it maintains the, the uh, calibration of the device, of the analyzer. <clears throat> From the turning grading, all the wavelengths are selected and projected to the detector, and that's depending on what wavelength we're looking for. Again, of course, our IR region is 0 0.8 to 1,000 micrometers. The detector output is in the form of pulses of voltage, which deflect the pen on a uh, recorder. Amount of movement of the pen is proportional to the change in transmittance. So in this case here, on my sample cell, I have some absorbance and, and transmittance. Then all of a sudden, there's nothing coming through. So my sample cell and my reference are equal. So what mean that means that there is no absorption. So there is no sample in that sample system or the sample yeah, cell. If the sample cell does not absorb IR from the selected wavelength, the output of the sample and the reference are the same. So what happens here is I'm selecting a, some sort of a wavelength in here. And when I find the wavelength that I'm looking for, for say CO, uh, I know what I, I know that I have it once it starts to it starts to absorb and less transmittance here. So the way we get this output is from that chopper. Non-dispersed infrared analyzers. The design allows the measurement of a single substance in a process stream containing many components. And that's important too because uh, if I have a sample stream and I have a, a bunch of components in that sample stream, but I really don't care about anything but CO, then I need to pick that uh, that wavelength that CO will absorb. Consider mostly for qual qualitative analysis. There are no prisms, gratings, or other dispersed IR devices on a non-dispersed infrared. And common designs are dual beam, and single beam. Now that's the design of uh, when we talk about the design. In this case, we talk about the light sources. We can have dual beam and single beam, and we'll we'll discuss all of that. So dual beam on nine and ten. Sample uh, flows through the sample cell. So here I've got a sample cell here, and I have a sample cell here, but I've got two beams. So it's a dual beam analyzer. I've got the chopper right here. So it chop it it turns this way. So as my light shining on here, I use the same light source on the first one, and then the, the same lights on the second, same source on the second. But this chop goes around and around and gives us that that sample cell reference cell sample cell, and continues to do that. And this the same happens down below on on beam two. Reference cell contains gas and uh, that does not absorb IR. So again, we talked about nitrogen being the most common in our, in our uh, reference cell. So what happens on this reference cell is when we allow the reference beam to go through it, nothing is absorbed. So the intensity of this beam um, is detected by the, the detector. And there's uh, the what's going in is coming out because there's nothing in here uh, that absorbs 
the uh, UV light. Compensates for power drift. Now, this is kind of a statement. Uh, when I talk about compensation, uh, it's how the uh, cell reacts. And they're talking here about di dirty windows. So on all my sample cells, as you guys know, because we talked about sample cells before, we have these windows here, right? There's windows here and windows here. And it's, uh, it's telling me that this dual beam compensates for power supply drift and deflector changes using two light beams of differential detector. The dual beam cannot compensate for dirty sample windows. So if I get dirty sample windows here, because it's two different detectors, basically, I'm um, working together. I may have different readings here if my cells are dirty, my window cells, right? So I've got to keep those clean. And that's what it's saying about this dual beam that cannot compensate for dirty sample cell windows. So if, if I ask you a question on a dual beam, this will be the main disadvantage. Single beam. In this case here, I have my IR source. I have a single beam going through here, going through my sample cell, my samples in, my sample out, IR detector, and then readouts. Uh, one thing I have here though, it, it's like a chopper, so it'll stop those waves, but it has a reference wavelength filter. And that's on a single beam. <coughs> Excuse me. This is on page 11. So compensates for power supply drift using a measure and reference filter. And this one compensates for dirty sample cells by shining all the light through the sample cell. So because it's, it's, um, because it's single beam, you don't have to worry as much about the windows and making sure they're clean. Uh, because as this turns and everything, that um, it, it will slowly degrade as far as the absorption and stuff because this, uh, the uh, windows are dirty but it'll compensate for that or a dual beam won't because each one of those beams on a dual beam each one of those sections can be different as far as how clean your windows are a single ir source a rotating filter wheel a sample cell for continuous flow an a ir detector and readout device electronics We'll get into more of this um, single beam. <clears throat> Again, because I have my filter wheel, alternates measuring IR devices at the reference. So here we've got, um, and when I look back at this, right? So this is going to be a reference, and this is going to be my measured wavelength of filter that I've, of choice that I want to come through that filter. And uh, from before, if it's four micrometers, uh, then that IR source is going to pick up CO. So here are my reference, and then my chopper wheel goes to my measured IR, and that goes back to reference, measured IR. So here's here's what the output is like. So my re uh, reference, full transmission, no absorbance. My measure, we have um, partial transmittance, and we have absorbance. And then again, back to the reference, where we have no um, trans, we have full transmit and no absorbance. And then that goes out to my readout electronics. So transmission equals sample signal and reference. And A, absorption is proportional to the concentration. The higher the concentration, the more it absorbs. And here's your absorption is log of 1 over transmit. And again, that's coming up. Uh, so... That comes up quite a bit, so there'll be some questions on that for sure. Learning objective two, describe the sources, cells, and detectors utilized by uh, NDIR analyzers. Non-dispersed infrared analyzer components are sources, and sample cells are the same between dual beam and single beam NDIR analyzers. Dual beam and NDIR analyzers use detectors that are wavelength specific. And all that's saying is that this, this is non-dispersive, right? That means it's using selective wavelengths or specific wavelengths. 
Single beam, non-dispersed IR analyzers use detectors that measure all IR wavelengths. Sources, uh, when we talked about this before in spectros uh, spectroscopic analyzers, we talked about a wire, and this one's nickel chromium or filament or an element, or um, and it produces wavelengths from 2 to 15 micrometers. So that's very uh, dispersed. Dual beam analyzers require two equally balanced beams. This is dual beam is provided in two ways, a pair of filaments. So in this case, I have filament here and a filament here. It's not the same, not a single a single filament with a concave mirror. So in this case here, this is dual filament and dual beam, and this is single beam. And the single beam uses a whole bunch of uh, mirrors and reflective surfaces, where a dual beam is two, two actual independent sources. one of the things they say about these in um, these filaments here or the independent sources they have to be exactly the same so uh, there's filters and everything else that will do this for us we don't get into that but um, we all know that different light sources are, are going to be a little bit different um, but we'll have filters in these light sources to uh, to pick up the the reference or the wavelength of choice. Sample cells. We've talked about these two, and of course there's uh, calculations with this. Stainless steel tubes with gold plating on the inside and transparent windows on either side. Gold makes a highly reflective surface. Beer Lambert's law is used to determine uh, path length. The optimum absorbance is 0 0.5. It talks about if the path length is too short, there's not enough absorption, and the detector can't distinguish between the reference cell and the sample cell. So we'll have to change my path length. If the path length is too long, the detector signal deviates from the Beer-Lambert law, and the reading is invalid. So again, when we talk about the Beer-Lambert law, talk about the path, the cell length, and all that kind of stuff. We've already talked about that, so you should recognize some of this terminology. Here's our formula. Absorbance A is proportional to the sample absorptivity, the path length, and the concentration. So absorbance is equal to ABC. Transpose, when we're looking at the path length, which is our B, B is equal to absorbance over here, absorptivity and concentration. So when we talk about Beer-Lambert's law, uh, to determine the path length, the optimum absorbance is 0 0.5. So I change this length here till I get an absorbance of 0 0.5, and that's optimum. That's going to be my optimum size of my cell or path length. Types of detectors, page 17. Differential IR detectors, wideband IR detectors. Differential detectors compare IR intensities between sample and reference beams in a dual beam non-dispersed IR analyzer. Uh, left detector. Changes capacitance as gas pressure changes. We'll talk about that. And this is our left. And this is on page 17. On the next two pages, I'll, I'll explain exactly how they work. Uh, but, but showing you here, um, you have a, a readout, and obviously this is a capacitance. There, there's a thin metal membrane here. And as it goes back and forth, back and forth, it changes capacitance. And the, the, the capacitance is going to be detected by the readout of the electronics. 
The other detector is a microflow detector, and it changes flow rate of gas between sealed chambers uh, as gas pressure rises or falls in this case. And that's what that looks like. So those, these are on page 17. I have a, a window here. And my detector has sample gas in there. And between the two, there's a real fine line there, tubing or just whatever it is. And it's our my flow sensor. So this luft works on capacitance. This microflow that's in the wording it works on flow. <clears throat> okay, so here's our luft detector. Um, it's, it'll be good if you know this because I, I, I believe there is a few questions on it. it talks about luft detectors. Now, what happens here is nothing's different because we all know that here, here's our dual beam. Here's our chopper. Um, so the sample beam here at this point in time is uh, letting through the sample, going through the sample cell. And that sample cell is, has continuous uh, flow of gases. Uh, it goes in through this window, and this is IR radiation. And basically what it does is it heats it up. Uh, it's, and it's proportional to the amount of IR that's gone through. So if IR, IR goes through and heats this up, it pushes this thin membrane out, and my capacitance changes here. So IR intensity decreases, pressure decreases. Mem uh, membrane moves to the left. So it's showing you here that my IR intensity has decreased. So this sample cell has absorbed a whole bunch because it's decreasing the amount of IR that's going to my luft detector. So if it decreases, uh, the heat in here is also decreasing because IR is, causes heat buildup. And this membrane comes back away, so I have more capacitance. Less, sorry, less capacitance. Closer it is, I have more capacitance. And that's how this one works, the left detector. <clears throat> On this one, it's the opposite. So I've, my chopper wheel goes around, my reference beam goes into here. Uh, I have all the IR going into here, and this gas is going to be similar to the gas that I'm uh, in my sample cell. I have all this IR going through here, so it heats up quite a bit more and then of course this thin membrane because this is heating up and expanding it's pushing this thin membrane closer to the, the other side which is the other plate of the capacitor and then when it goes back to my sample cell uh, ir intensity decreases because the sample cell is absorbing it and there'll be a fine line, and this happens like milliseconds, right? It doesn't tell you in the in the in the book or anything like that how fast it happens, but it's it's milliseconds. So this is the luft detector. The microflow detector. Again, it's got chopper, and sometimes you're sometimes going through the sample cell, and sometimes the, the all the full wavelength goes through the reference cell. So I've got a flow sensor here, and in this case here, when my when my light shines through my reference cell, there's no IR absorbed whatsoever. So this starts to heat up. When I've got sample cell light going through the sample cell, there's some IR absorbed here, so I I have less in here. So normally, what happens is this uh, through the reference cell heats up, and there's a tiny little flow that flows this way because the pressure is increased with increased heat. A little bit of flow flows this way towards the detection, detector gas of the sample cell. So this flow, amount of flow, is picked up by, well, it's a flow meter, basically. And it's picked up by the detector, the, the readout device. <clears throat> when both chopper blocks are, are with the chopper, both beams are stopped. Nothing goes through the sample cell. Nothing goes through the reference cell. Because this has more pressure in it, 
because the flow has been going this way when uh, this has been heated up over here. So when I stop that light, then the pressure here pushes that flow back down. And again, it goes to the readout electronic device. So this is a microflow detector. In your book, it also say this is the a newer one, a newer type of uh, microflow. And it also says that this is not affected by vibration. So if it's out in the plant and it's sitting there vibrating, it's not affected. Where if I look at uh, this one here, it can be affected because of from vibration where the micro sensor isn't. Microflows are not affected by vibrations, so therefore they're widely used, more widely used. Wideband IR detectors uh, responds to a wide range of IR wavelengths, can be used in both single and dual beam non-dispersed IR analyzers, page 20. The types of these are pyroelectric, they contain crystals that convert IR energy into electrical current. And the other type is photoconductive. And that's the most sensitive of, the, of the, both of the detectors. Contain crystals that change their electrical resistance. All right. On to objective three. Negative, describe negative and positive filtering techniques as applied in industry. first one is going to be positive and it just shows you this uh, but it doesn't tell you that it's positive but this is how the positive filtering works so an interference gas is a gas that absorbs similar wavelengths as the target gas so carbon dioxide will interfere with carbon monoxide measurement and I'll show you how this works here's our spectrum absorbance how much is, is being absorbed and the wavelength as the wavelength increases so CO is my target gas. That's the gas that I'm after for this analyzer to analyze qualitative and quantitative. So that's my target gas. CO2 is my interference gas. So what happens is as the wavelength increases or decreases, we get a change in absorbance. So CO2 absorbs very similar wavelengths than CO, but as this CO2 absorbs this wavelength the co looks like it's it's absorbing more well it does it it makes this absorb more and then again if i add even more co2 and i get this co and this is my target gas it increases also the absorbance so using interference gas causes absorption of the target gas to increase because the absorbent wavelengths overlap and adds to the co absorbance so this is called positive filtering when I use an interference gas. Techniques include positive filtering, and that's what this is. And then the other one we'll talk about is negative filtering. Page 23. So again, positive filtering removes the interference IR wavelengths from the sample beam of a dual beam NDIR analyzer. So you can see here in my sample cell, this is where I'd put my CO2. I'm looking for CO, but this is a CO2. So as my beam goes through, the CO2 is going to absorb, which makes uh, which makes the CO absorb even more of that wavelength too. A filter cell contains a high concentration of the interfering gas. So this is the interfering gas here. right on here on the sample cell, at the end of the sample cell. The filter cell is filled with CO2, any change in CO will be uh, detected. And you can see here we're using a LUF detector in this case. Use the differential IR detector. So this is differential IR detector with the LUFT. And then of course my, my readout is gonna be here. 
negative filtering, also known as gas filter correlation, GFC analyzer. Reference filter contains a high concentration of the target gas and it absorbs IR. So basically, well, let, me, let me keep going here. Measurement filter contains nitrogen. And we know that there's no infrared absorbed by nitrogen. So in this case here, I've got a single source. I've got a rotating wheel. So this is called a, ga a, a filter correlation. When this turns around to the light, I have no filtering whatsoever. So all of the, all of the light goes through. Then when I turn it to CO, the CO wavelengths are being absorbed and they don't pass through here. So it, it's the why the, that's why they call it negative filtering. So I have a measurement filter cell and a reference filter cell. And as it just keeps turning like this, and then different wavelengths go through your sample gas cell, again, back to your detector and then you read out. So in this case, if I look at this on your book and that's on page 26 to 30, you got your measurement minus your reference is your CO and all of this is reference. So, so when I have this reference, it's filled with nitrogen and it doesn't absorb any IR whatsoever. So this subtracts the, the uh, this subtracts all the CO wavelengths because it, it's absorbed into this filter and the rest of the wavelengths go out. And that's why it's called negative filtering because I'm, I'm taking, taking the CO IR um, beams out with that filter. <clears throat> Uses a wide band IR detector. Okay, so basically this is the last objective. Describe process applications for infrared analyzers using the following two types of sample situations. Analyze condition extract samples. And we've, we've seen that and I'll show you that again. In situ uh, analysis of stack gas using GFC analyzers. Non-dispersed infrared analyzers are designed for clean dry samples. So in this case here, I've got a sample system right here. Um, this is my analyzer. So all of this is my sample system. And this cooler water is a uh, condenser and the water to drain. And as I say, this is waste product. So a lot of times this waste product will be put right back into our process stream or our stack gas or whatever it is we're, we're analyzing. I've got a heated line here, I've got a pump, particulate filter. I got a bypass flow to safe location. Safe location is back into here uh, or, or I have to manage it some other way. Analyzer flow, inline filter. We don't talk about this stuff because we only talked about that on the spectroscopic analyzers, but you know how all this works. So flue gas is hot, wet, and full of particulate. Before sampling, the sampling needs to be conditioned. Reducing dew point removes water vapor. That's why it's cooler. I'm reducing that dew point and dropping the water out. Using particulate filter to remove all particulate matter right here. And continue cleaning calibration is required. So that's when they say you have to have access to these things. The bypass flow provides rapid flow rate to reduce sample line lag time. So we're talking about this bypass flow. This gas can be toxic, corrosive, and must be handled properly. So in situ is called open path here, carbon monoxide sampling. This is just gonna show you how this IR sample works or the analyzer works. So more sensitive than double beam instruments and measure and uh, correct for all IR absorbing interferences in the stack. So when I talked about extractive, this is a sample system. 
The sample is withdrawn from uh, is withdrawn from a single point in the stack. The open path in situ gives an average of all the CO molecules in the in the stack beam path. Uh, extractive uh, particulates and water must be removed, changing the stack composition. In this case, there's nothing to do but no no change in stack composition at all. Uh, extractive, you got longer lag times, shorter lag times, and open path. Uh, more maintenance problems due to sampling system, and that's where most of our sample system uh, uh, errors occur is in the sample system. And here it's no sample system problems. So here we are with our stack, uh, and here we are with in situ, or in this case, they, they called it open path. So this is the open path here. So I've got an IR source. What happens is I've got a chopper. I've got a correlation cell. I get nitrogen and CO reference, and it just spins here, again, just as, as a normal analyzer. Um, the IR light goes through, hits a mirror, and comes back. And then it's then it's diverted up to a signal processor, and this is a wideband IR detector. So basically, uh, we're talking about in situ, and we don't need any sample system. We're just shining shining this light through here. It comes back, and it's detecting how much absorbance of these chemicals or whatever I'm looking for. And then of course it, it will come up here. We have less uh, intensity. Uh, so we, we've had absorbance in here and goes to our signal processor to give us readouts. Now each one of these particular compounds here will give us different readings. For analysis, Oh man, you guys did this in third year when we when we um, talked about vibration. We had the four, Fourier transform infrared, so we have it here also. So measured IR absorbance spectrum in seconds. So this is what's happening here. This is this the four A takes this and builds it into some sort of graph that we can use. And this is absorbance and the wavelength frequency. Frequency decreases here, frequency increases. So then we can actually get multiple compounds, molecules from this absorption spectrum. So what happens here, no different. All they're talking about this Fourier analysis, all of these up and down, up and down can be changed to this. I don't know if you guys remember that in vibration in third year. But the Fourier analysis just gives us something that we can actually read instead of looking at this right there. How can I read that? Uses constructive and destructive waves interference to select a wide range of wavelengths. Can identify and measure concentrations of gases in samples. Calibrating and troubleshooting. Obviously, you must routinely check the analyzer's zero and span for drift. Clean the glasses. Calibration should be done in accordance with manual manufacturer's recommendation. If you ever see this, this manufacturer's recommendation on an IP test, you always pick manufacturer's recommendation because they built it. So if it talks about uh, uh, some sort of um, group that... Um, gives you examples of how to record or anything like that. Um, everything should be done by manufacturer's recommendation. So if you see that on your IP, you pick that. They're the ones that made it. They have all their recommendations are to that specific analyzer. Ideal zero gas should be typical process sample when the measured gas is removed. Gas filter correlation analyzers use a sealed span gas cell, for automatically adjusting the span. And I think they show that, oh, there it is right here. So you got a span gas sample cell here. So what happens is when, there, when this, this stack is down, 
they'll just fire that sample gas right in here. They'll move it into it. So when it's online, they move it out. During calibration, they'll move that span gas in here. So the span gas comes in here and we can do a full span. So it uses a sealed span gas cell for automatically adjusting the span. Sample handling systems are often the cause of our bad data. We know that. Troubleshoot disconnect from sample handling system and run zero in span checks. So of course here, we, we disconnect it from the sampling system and then we zero in span calibration checks with calibration gases. That's just our calibration itself with a zero span. Analyzers can be faulty. If you cannot perform a zero span, the fault typically lies with the analyzer. So in this case here, we can't blame the sampling system. If we're going to zero and span it and it's not working, then we change that analyzer out or fix it or send it to back to the manufacturer. Temper and, temperature and pressure are obviously important. So gas density and concentration increase with decreasing temperature and increasing pressure. Placing a sample cell inside a temperature control block and venting to atmosphere compensates the effects of temperature and pressure. So this is the case here where I've got a sample cell here and it's being monitored for temperature and pressure. So here, here we got holes for heaters and temperature sensors. There's our cell windows. And then this here is our sample in and out. So it's just showing you the sample cell here. And it's telling you that we need to keep the pressure and the temperature constant so that we have accurate readings. Temperature and pressure re, uh, recent analyzers use microprocessors with pressure and temperature sensors to correct for the temperature and pressure. So again, this is a sample cell and it's in that block on the last page right here. There's that sample cell that's in there. This is electrically heated. You got a temperature sensor here and a pressure sensor here. So that goes back to the analyzer microprocessor and it corrects. Summary, DIR analyzers scan the sample with a broad range. DIR is dispersed and NDIR non-dispersed analyzer scan a narrow band. The non-dispersed uh, infrared uses a wound nickel chromium wire sample cell transparent to IR. Differential or wide band detectors, depending on the filter technique. Filtering technique is positive or negative. Positive filter uses a dual beam analyzer, differential detector, and a stationary filter cell. Negative filtering uses a single beam analyzer, wide band detector, and a rotating filter wheel. Infrared analyzers can be used on samples extracted from stack or in situ. And they call, they call this in situ on the stack, in this case, is open path. And that, my friends, is infrared analyzers in a nutshell. Stop recording.